Hi everybody, in lesson two of week nine, looking at ways of studying the brain, we focus on ERPs and fMRI scans. So in this session, we'll make a distinction between those two methods of studying the brain. We'll take a close look at how fMRI scans actually work, as well as contribute to even more specialist terminology that you'll need when talking about this topic. So let's see what you know already. So we think about ERPs, event-related potentials, and fMRI scans, functional magnetic resonance imaging. What do you know already? Have you seen these referenced anywhere in your books or your resources? Maybe you've even spoke about them in class already. Pause the video for two minutes while you jot down anything you can remember. Let's start with ERPs. So it stands for event-related potential. And very similar to EEGs, it's a way to measure the activity in the brain. Now, one thing it is better at than an EEG is that it provides us more specific information about the brain, whereas EEGs were much more general. The other difference is that an ERP is in response to a stimulus. So an individual will still have their brain waves recorded, they're still going to wear the electrodes, and we're still going to measure the activity and it'll be outputted onto a graph, but here the participant or the patient is going to be given some type of stimulus and we're going to measure the response to that stimulus rather than just a general response. fMRI scans, on the other hand, functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is the only type that you have to know that is a brain scan involving technology and multiple pieces of equipment. And the function of an MRI scan is that it measures something special about the blood flow in the brain and again in response to something, something like a stimuli, it could be an image, a task, anything at all. Let's take a closer look at ERPs, event related potentials then. So an activity in response to a task or stimuli is recorded via the electrodes that we mentioned earlier. And once the participants or patients are given the stimuli, and it could be something like a sound or an image, it's presented quite a number of times. So you may find in research something's presented about 100 times, and then the average brain response is calculated. And that's how we get a bit more of a specific reading from the brain. So by doing this, it helps to isolate the brain's reaction to the stimulus and filter out any general brain activity that may be irrelevant to the stimulus. The time between the presentation of this stimulus and the response from the patient's brain or the participant's brain is referred to as latency. So there's another specialist term to add to your list. The brain waves, in other words, the responses that occur within 100 milliseconds following the presentation of whichever stimulus has been used, that's referred to as a sensory ERP because they reflect a sensory response to the stimulus. So naturally, they're the ones that are going to happen immediately in response to whatever's being presented. But any ERPs that occur after 100 milliseconds, so a small delay, they're referred to as cognitive ERPs, and that's because they demonstrate that some information had to be processed first. So we've got our sensory ERPs, which are almost like our reflex responses, and then we've got the later ones, that show that there's perhaps some cognitive thought involved. So let's think about this a little more. This is the apparatus that you'd wear for an EEG or an ERP assessment. And you may recognize this image from our earlier lesson. How would you feel if you were wearing this for a few hours? And also have a think, could this impact your brain waves anyway? So this is critical thinking, but pause the video for 60 seconds while you ponder on these questions and jot your thoughts down. Now we'll come back to your answers on those a little later when we do some evaluation. So keep that to one side. And let's take a look now at fMRI scans. Now fMRI scans measure the blood flow in the brain and it's measured when participants or patients are asked to perform a specific task. The fMRI machine itself works on the premise that neurons that are active in the brain are most active during a task. And that's because they're using the most energy. And oxygen is carried in the bloodstream, and that's attached to hemoglobulin found in red blood cells. 
and it's released for use by these active neurons, at which point the haemoglobin becomes deoxygenated. So make sure that you can use all these terms when describing how an fMRI works, because it is much more than somebody going into an fMRI machine. It's also not quite straightforward in terms of measuring blood flow, because actually what we're looking for is deoxygenated blood. And that tells us that the neurons are active. Now, deoxygenated haemoglobin has a different magnetic quality from oxygenated haemoglobin. And magnetic qualities, that's what is detected by these fMRI scans, and they're used to create a moving 3D map image of the brain. And any active areas in response to the stimuli that patients or participants are given are visible on the scan on the output. We know the brain activity requires oxygen, and that means that we're going to find an increased blood flow to the area being used. And the activity is visible approximately one to four seconds after they occur, so we've got a slight delay, and they're thought to be accurate within one to two millimetres, so good spatial resolution there. Similar to earlier, let's have a think about how you would feel if you were in this fMRI scanner machine on screen for 20 minutes. Sometimes scans can take much longer than this, but think about how you'd feel going headfirst into this machine, where once you're in there, it's a very confined space. There'll be millimetres between uh, your, your nose, your head and the machine itself. No room to move your arms. And even if you did have any room at all, no movement allowed whatsoever. And that's because it could really distort the image that's coming out of the scan. Pause the video for 60 seconds, imagine that scenario for and being in there that long and think about how you yourself would feel. Now ERP and EEG are both ways of measuring the brain and they both have some similarities and some differences. But can you spot any of them? Pause the video for 10 minutes while you use all your available resources, including anything you've picked up in these lessons so far and see what similarities you can identify and what differences you can identify as well. Here's some suggested answers to that question. So both use electrodes to measure the brain waves, so there's a similarity. EEG records general activity, but ERP records specifics, so there's a difference. And we know that's a difference because we've used the trigger word whereas, and that tells the examiner that we are contrasting the two methods. ERP measures response to a stimulus, EEG doesn't. Both are non-invasive and both have poor spatial resolution. Now even though we said the ERP is one to two millimetres and that's not too bad, in contrast to other methods it is quite poor, if you contrast it to something like post-mortems for example. Both have got good temporal resolution, meaning that we haven't got much of a delay. 